Many years ago, there was a little tank engine who served as station pilot at Barrow and Finesse. The little shunter performed his pilot duties as instructed, but remained rather vocal about his true aspirations. It isn't fair. I spend all my time arranging trains for you lot when I don't get to pull any myself. I want my very own express. Oh, keep dreaming, the other engines would tell him, knowing he was far too small for such a task. The little engine simply ignored him, still hoping that one day he'd be able to pull an express train. This, however, wasn't meant to be, for the little shunter would remain station pilot all the way up until the night of May the 7th, 1941. Well, I'm sure you can piece together what became of him. The station was promptly rebuilt and several engines were brought in to service it, including myself. Most believe this is where the tale of the little engine ends, though they'd be mistaken. Mistaken? Did I miss something? It sounds like he was blown up. Oh, he was, yes. Though according to old railwaymen, on a cold, dark night, express trains have been known to suddenly break down. The crew leaves to get help and when they return, they'll find it to have seemingly vanished, never to be seen again. Of course, no one knows for certain where the train goes, but if you ask me, it's the little engine's ghost refusing to let something as insignificant as death stop him from fulfilling his wish to pull the express. Well. That was certainly one of your more outlandish stories, Jinty. And that's saying something. I'd best get going now. It's always, um, interesting talking to you. Goodbye, Gordon. Mind you stay on the lookout for that little engine. Wouldn't want you being dragged away by a ghost now, would we? Ha. Uh. The next morning, Gordon was waiting at the platform for his passengers to board. He was still thinking about Jinty's story. Morning, Gordon. Everything all right with you? Uh, I suppose so. You don't sound very convincing. I guess I'm just a bit annoyed. Tell me, Thomas, do you remember hearing about a ghost engine that steals express trains? This would have been a long time ago. Oh, that old legend? I remember it vaguely. I think it was a big deal for a little while. I can't really say for sure, though. I didn't leave the yard much in those days. Why do you ask? That was the subject of Jim T's story last night. You've, um, spoken to him before. So you know how he can be. I wanted to know if there was any truth to what he was saying. Ah, wanting to know if you had anything to be scared of, eh? Of course not! Believing whatever nonsense Genty is spewing is far beneath me! <laughs> Relax, Gordon, I'm joking. No need to get so defensive. Oh, uh, well, I, um... Ah, that's for me. I'll see you later, little Thomas. <laughs> It's only me, Gordon. Don't worry. I'm not here to swipe your express. Oh, terrific. It seems as though Thomas has been running his mouth, hasn't he? Perhaps. I almost didn't believe him. Gordon, the big express engine, afraid of getting his train stolen by a ghost. <laughs> what a lark. Humph. The only thing I'm scared of is annoying little engines like you barging up and spoiling my image. You need to know your place, little James. Huh. Can you just hurry up? You're not the only engine here who needs water, you know. I'll take as much time as I need. I've got to fill my tanks up for my run tonight. A night's express? Oh, no wonder you're so worked up. Mind you don't lose your train now. <laughs> uh, 
you really are the worst, little James. Gordon backed down onto his express right on schedule and was now waiting for his passengers to board. Though he tried his best to hide it, he was feeling a bit nervous. Stupid story. I can't believe I'm even entertaining the idea. Did you say something, Gordon? Huh? Oh, uh, um, no. Just, just thinking aloud is all. <laughs> Gordon raced down the line, making good time at first. Though as he passed Kronk, he began to feel a pain in his boiler. Uh, never mind. I'll have it looked at when we reach Barrow. But he never got the chance. By the time he reached Vickerstown, the pain was unbearable. He'd barely left Sodor when... The driver quickly shut off steam and brought the train to a halt. Well, it looks like you're not going any further tonight, old boy. You've burst your safety valve. Uh, yes, I know. I suppose you'll be leaving to get help now. Don't worry, we're only a mile or so out from Vickerstown. Shouldn't be gone for too long. I see. Gordon's crew headed back up the line leaving Gordon and his train all alone. What felt like hours passed, a fog had come down, and Gordon's crew still hadn't returned. By now, all he could think about was Jinty's story. Just a story. Just a story. But, surely... Driver should be back by now. Oh, that sounds like an engine. Huh, who's there? Uh, hello? I is anyone? <coughs> no, 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 it, it can't be. The gente story. It's, it's, no. STAY AWAY! DON'T TAKE MY EXPRESS! HELP! HELP! Er, um, Gordon? Are you alright? Gordon opened his eyes. He looked back and saw Edward buffering up to his train. He was relieved, but also rather embarrassed. Oh, Edward, my dear engine, am I ever glad to see you. I'm sure you are. I'm sorry it took so long to get you help. I was all the way back at Wellsworth when I got the call. Come on now, let's get you to Barrow. Before long, Edward had pushed Gordon and the Express to Barrow. The passengers were a bit upset at the delay, but were glad to finally be at their destination. A relief diesel from the other railway was called in to take the train back to Sodor, giving Edward and Gordon some time to rest before the journey home. Thank you for helping me, Edward. It wasn't fun sitting out there alone. Oh, it's my pleasure, Gordon. By the way, um, what were you yelling about back there? Oh, um, that, uh, yes, I thought you were someone else. Sorry. <sighs> Jinty told you that story about the ghost engine that steals expresses, didn't he? Yes, he did. I was a bit freaked out by it. Is there any truth to it? No, well, sort of, I suppose. There was a shunter here who was killed in the bombings, but he never really talked about wanting to pull the express, nor was he the kind to try stealing them. His name was George, and he was a very kind engine. I always enjoyed speaking with him when I'd bring passenger trains here. It's a shame what happened to him. Then, where did this business about him stealing express trains come from? 
shortly after the station bombing, an express train traveling at night went missing. It was quickly found out the train had simply seen fighter jets and had stopped in a tunnel for safety reasons, though by then, rumors of a ghost engine being responsible had already begun to spread. It's always upset me seeing George's legacy misrepresented like that, though the story is so ingrained in folklore that setting the record straight is difficult at best. That's too bad. I hope that one day, people will know the true story. For his sake. That'd be nice, Gordon. I think he'd like that a lot. One evening, Frank was arranging some empties up at the Marthwaite Zinc Mine. The other engines had all finished their duties for the day, and Frank was looking forward to joining them in the shed. His driver climbed down from the cab and walked off for a smoke break, leaving Frank sitting alone. As Frank sat waiting, he thought he could hear the faint sound of an engine puffing. That's strange. I didn't think we had any evening train scheduled. All done, boy. We can be off now. I'm sure you're looking forward to a rest. Quite so, yes. By the way, who's on night duty tonight? Well, there's no one I'm aware of. There aren't any night trains scheduled. Then, who was that I heard puffing just now? Just now, you say? Odd. I haven't heard anything of the sort. Are you sure you heard an engine? As sure as the sun setting in the evening. Mm -mm. Perhaps you're a bit more tired than you think. Come on, let's get you home. Not a moment too soon. Frank muttered as he pulled away, feeling a bit uneasy about the whole situation. It was nearly dark by the time Frank reached the junction. His driver got out to set the points. As he did, Frank thought he could hear the puffing again. You alright, Frank? You look pale. Uh, huh? Yeah, oh, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm alright. Let's just get moving again. Just as the junction was leaving his line of sight, Frank suddenly caught a glimpse of a yellow engine turning off down the line to the mine. Chalk? What's he doing out this late? Jock, what were you doing up by the mine at Marthwaite? Me? I haven't been up there all day. Why do you ask? Because I saw an engine puffing down the track to the mine. It was dark and I didn't get a good look at him, but he was definitely yellow. Well, I've been here in the shed for a while. I finished up my last run a few hours ago. The small controller must have purchased a new engine. That? <laughs> or you're seeing things, Frank. I am not seeing things. I know what I saw. No, you don't. But I might. You know something about this engine. Well, I know of an old legend. Legend? Like fantasy? Perhaps. But no one can say for sure. During the earliest days of the Mid-Sodor Railway, Duke, the first engine on the line, was the railway's only engine. They would sometimes borrow other engines from here or there, but it was becoming clear the railway needed a second engine of their own. The railway didn't have a lot of money at this point, so when the controller scored a favorable deal with the South American Loco Company, he took it at once. The engine that arrived was a large yellow tank engine, he didn't speak a word of English, so communicating with him was difficult, and no one was ever able to get his name. Despite this, 
He appeared to be a hard worker, and he did his work in a timely manner and was never late. To most, he appeared to be a more than suitable addition to the Mid-Sodor fleet. However, those who worked closest to him began to notice some strange behavior and realized that maybe all wasn't right with this engine. He'd frequently mutter in his language under his breath. Though no one could understand what he was saying, it appeared to be a chant of some sort. He was quiet about it, but some still noticed. Even stranger, the railway's migrant workers noticed the engine wasn't speaking in Spanish. It was some other unknown language. Workers from a wide range of nationalities attempted to identify it, but to no avail. But perhaps even stranger was his nightly behavior. It's said that some nights, the engine would leave his shed for an unexplained reason, chanting in his odd tongue. No one knows where he went or what he did, just that he'd always be back by morning. Many people became increasingly nervous around the engine, and since no one could ask the engine where he went, rumors began to spread about the strange things he could be up to. Eventually, the manager had had enough, and made plans to secretly follow the engine. Every night for a few days, the manager and Duke's crew would hide in his cab, waiting for the engine to leave for wherever he went. Then, one night, the yellow engine began his odd chanting. The men readied themselves, and sure enough, the engine left his shed and puffed off into the mist. Duke followed a few minutes later, racing through the fog and attempting to catch up with the engine. That would be the last time anyone would ever see the yellow engine, for even after traveling up and down the entire line, Duke and the men were unable to find him. He'd seemingly vanished into the mist. A search party was called the following morning, and they searched for a few days, only to find no trace of the engine or where he'd gone. The only clue came from a signalman, who claimed he'd seen the engine heading towards the mine at Marthwaite, but nobody could verify this. Sensing something off about the entire situation, the manager ceased looking for the engine and ordered a new one instead. This engine would come to be known as Stanley, who I'm sure you're all aware had his own set of issues. though none quite as bizarre as that old yellow engine. The manager, not wanting Ward to get out about the ordeal, completely erased any and all records of the engine existing. Photographs, incident reports, timetables, all disposed of. The engine had only been on the railway for just over a month in total, so it wasn't all that difficult to do. He instructed his staff never to speak of the yellow engine and said that if anyone asked about him, he'd simply been sold off to another railway. Before long, everyone had forgotten about the legend and it had successfully been made as though he'd never existed. Over the years, however, people have reported sightings of the mysterious engine roaming up and down the rails on his journey to who knows where. Some have claimed it may be chanting in its odd language, but no one can say for sure, as those who get close enough to tell you are never seen again. Well, uh, that's, uh, 
quite the story, Bert. Though it sounds as though it's based more in folklore than reality. Agreed. You probably just saw a yellow car or something, Frank. So, where'd you hear this story, Bert? Oh, I don't know. It was a long time ago. Probably from some tourists or something. Hmm. So it would appear you either saw a demon engine, or literally anything else. Your call, Frank. Tough decision. I think I've got to go with the literally anything else, personally. <laughs> I mean, believe whatever you wish. It's just a story, after all. Good. I wish to not believe it, as I'm sure is true for the rest of you. I've had a long day. Can we please stop going on about spooky vanishing engines now? That might just be the first intelligent statement you've made, Mike. <sighs> now let's all get some rest. Stan Lee's life had slowly fallen into monotony. The reckless engine had caused one accident and one headache too many, and had been demoted to moving empty rolling stock around the railway. For a while, he'd been allowed good strains as well, uh, but you can only lose so many loads of coal and slate before that privilege is inevitably stripped away too. Now all the little red engine could do was pull empty trucks to the couple mines and yards around the Midsodor. Such work only served to worsen his already bad attitude. I say, Dookie, how in God's name do you get off on me suffering like this? Suffering? Now, I'd hardly call it suffering, Stanley. You put yourself in your position and continue to prove it's the only suitable place for someone like you. No sympathy, eh? Typical. You've done nothing substantial and yet everyone loves you because of your name you did nothing to earn. I was on the front lines during the war. But y'all treat me like an animal. It's not right. You may as well be an animal, Stanley. You certainly act like one. Why, not two days ago, you derailed outside Arlesdale, yes? Have some dignity. Now, I shudder to think what his grace would say should he see me working alongside such an engine as you. Here's a thought. Start taking some responsibility for your poor actions. The world isn't out to get you, Stanley. Duke said sharply, and he chuffed away. Stanley was a bit aggressive, but he wasn't completely wrong. He'd never been properly fitted to run on the railway's loading gauge. Because war department engines like him were made cheaply for mass manufacturing, the manager and the others put it down to him being a poor build. All of this weighed on Stanley non-stop, and now, having only the most trivial jobs to do, he felt more useless and depressed than ever. Late one evening, Stanley was running a flock of empty slate trucks up the line to the incline. They were needed for a large order of slate meant to go out in the morning, a train which Stanley, of course, would have no part in. Stupid manager. It's his fault I'm as accident prone as I am. If he'd get off his high horse, he'd see that. His poor judgment will see this railway closed one day. Stanley was still in a foul mood as he shunted the line of trucks into a siding. The points leading into the siding were particularly dodgy, and Stanley felt a clang as he rolled over them. Oi, you there! Y'all need to fix these jank points. If I didn't know any better, I'd think you were trying to derail me. 
The men came over and examined the points. Good on you for noticing, Stanley. If you'd gone over them one more time, you'd have surely derailed. Now, come on, lads. Let's go get our tools. You too. We'll need you to help us carry them. The workman said, gesturing to Stanley's crew. And so, they all walked off to fetch the tools, leaving Stanley all alone. As he waited, Stanley peered through the darkness at his surroundings. He'd visited the quarry many times during his tenure on the railway, but at night, he hardly recognized it. Everything looked strange and unfamiliar shrouded in darkness, and Stanley was hoping the men would be back before too long. Suddenly, Stanley felt someone step into his cab. Huh, back already? Did y'all even bother with the points? He sneered, thinking it was his driver. No response came. Hey, uh, you could at least acknowledge me. Again, nothing. Stanley felt a hand on his brakes, and then he began to roll forwards. Oh, yeah, yeah cut it out! I I'm, I'm gonna derail if you... Stanley found himself sitting on the ground next to the broken points. It was then that the men reappeared, including his crew. Stanley, what have you done? I, it, it, it wasn't me! Someone was in my cab and made me derail! Someone in your cab? Stanley, we've all been gathering tools. Who was it then? I don't know. He ain't left yet. Why don't you ask him yourself? There's... no one in your cab, Stanley. I don't know if you take us for fools or what. I get that you don't like your current work, but acting out like this is not how you go about protesting. But, but, but there was someone there! The men rolled their eyes and shook their heads before one of them walked off to phone for a crane. A few hours later, John arrived to clean up the mess. He looked at Stanley grumpily. Look, Stanley, I get that you don't care a damn about what you do, but some of us have actual work in the morning and need our rest to be prepared for it. Stanley said nothing. He knew John wouldn't believe him, so he decided not to waste his breath trying. It was early the next morning when Stanley crawled home to a shed. He was hoping to get a few hours of sleep in, but found the manager already there, waiting for him. I don't know what's wrong with you, Stanley. I've tried everything to make you see sense, but time and time again you disregard it all and make another mess for me to clean up. I'm sick of it! Should you cause one more accident, your punishment will be less than ideal for you. Do I make myself clear? Stanley, who was tired and still rather confused, muttered only a defeated, Yes, sir. The manager shook his head and walked away, leaving Stanley to collect his thoughts. Weeks passed, and Stanley soon forgot about the incident. To everyone else, it was just another accident, and Stanley decided it best to just leave it at that. The poor engine tried his best to stay out of trouble, and for a while, he was doing well. That was, until one fateful night when Stanley once again had to take a train of empty supplies up to the incline. Stanley hadn't been back up there since the accident, and was rather dreading it. Hey, it was just a slip of the brakes. It wasn't no one's fault. Now, I must have imagined the guy in my cab. But Stanley couldn't convince himself of this. Soon, he arrived at the incline, where he shunted the trucks into a siding, this time without issue. He was preparing to leave when a workman stopped him. We're on break now, having a smoke and some food. Wanna join us? It'll only be a few minutes. He offered to the crew, who gladly took the man up on his offer. They walked off into the fog, once more leaving Stanley all alone. Stanley kept a keen eye out for anyone who could be watching him through the fog, though he saw no one. Until, out of the corner of his eye, he noticed a figure walking towards him. Hey, uh, what are you doing over here? The man didn't answer. In fact, he didn't even look at Stanley. His gaze was instead fixated upon his cab, which he took the liberty of climbing into. Hey, get out of there, Stanley called. 
The man didn't answer. Instead, he grabbed the regulator and threw it open. Stanley shot forward. H help Stanley screamed. I I'm being hijacked! Hearing his cries, the men rushed over and were just in time to see Stanley picking up speed as he charged on down the line. Stanley found himself going faster and faster as he bumped down the quarry line, and before he knew it, Stanley was out on the main line. He continued to cry out for help, but it did him no good. Stanley was petrified, but could do nothing to stop. And then, as if things couldn't get any worse, he heard a whistle and saw a headlamp coming into view. Jennings was racing down the line with a late night passenger train. Stop! Stop! Get out of the way! Stanley cried out in desperation, but it was no use. When Stanley awoke, he found himself back at the sheds. He was badly damaged and in severe pain. He hadn't a clue how long he'd been out for, and couldn't remember how he'd gotten there. He's awake, sir. The manager nodded, and then turned his attention to the wrecked engine. I warned you, Stanley, and I thought maybe, just maybe I'd gotten through to you, but clearly I was wrong causing a horrible accident that injured several passengers and cost us an engine. Why? Just why? For your own amusement? All at once, Stanley's memories came flooding back. The runaway, the accident, and the mysterious man. I... it... it wasn't... Don't even go there! I promised you your punishment would be severe. And I intend to make good on that promise. He finished darkly before turning and walking away. Duke glared at Stanley, but said nothing before he too puffed away. Stanley was all alone, or so he thought. Through the low mist engulfing the ground, Stanley could see a man dressed in all black, staring him down from across the tree line in front of him. He blinked, and just like that, the figure was gone. Stanley didn't know who he was, nor his reasoning for doing what he did. Seeing workmen walking towards him carrying saws, jacks, and hammers, though, Stanley realized he'd have plenty of time to think about it. One evening, Edward was taking a train from Crocs Scrapyard to the Iron Works at Peel Godron. He was at Kildane, stopped at a red signal, when he saw Old Bailey step out of the station. Evening, Old Bailey. How are things? Oh, same as always, Edward. What are you doing out this way? Oh, just taking this load of scrap to the Iron Works. Any idea how the fog's supposed to be tonight? Thick as ever. Though that's to be expected around these parts. Not just the fog I'd be wary of, though. Strange things happen at this time of year. Strange things? What do you mean? Oh, I wouldn't be too concerned. Just stay mindful of your surroundings. I'll see you later, Edward. Um, uh, you too, Old Bailey. Old Bailey was right. The fog came down thick. As Edward made his way down the line, he tried his best to stay vigilant. Can you see anything, boy? Not much. I can't imagine it's any better on your end. You'd be right.
Who was that? Who was who? I just saw someone run into the woods. I'm sure of it. Huh. Didn't see anything myself. Old Bailey's the only one crazy enough to be out in this fog, and he's back at the station. Strange. Edward reached the ironworks without issue. He had just shunted his trucks into a siding when... <gasps> oh, come on now. Where's your Halloween spirit? Oh, hello, Harry. Uh, just a bit on edge is all. I think I saw someone in the woods earlier. Whoever it was didn't want to be seen. That's, uh, that's strange, isn't it? T t take care, Edward, and... Don't stay out in that fog longer than you have to. Oh, uh, thanks, Harry. Hmm. Soon, Edward was on his way back down the branch. Say, what was Harry on about back there? I'm not sure. I wish I'd have asked him to elaborate. I guess I was too dumbfounded to have gotten a heartfelt sentiment from an Iron Twin. Wait, Edward, do you see that? See what? Um, hello? Did you need something? Driver, do you hear that? What? The whispers? No. The footsteps. G -g Get us out of here, driver! I can't, Edward! They're blocking the line behind us! Well, there's got to be something we can- Go. Y y yeah yeah F thank you. The next morning, Edward was waiting at the platform with his first train of the day when a familiar face strode up to him. Morning, Edward. How'd the run last night go? It's uh, a lot to unpack, really. Well, I've got time. Tell me, you happen to see anything strange? I did, actually. There were these... these... people who... who came out of the woods, circling around me. I... I think they were... chanting, maybe? Or speaking in some language I couldn't recognize, at least. Hmm. How'd you get away? Aerie scared them off. I was a bit surprised to see him. Even those twins, cold as they are, wouldn't subject an engine to that. That? You know these people? Don't know them per se, more so know of them. There have long been talks of strange groups and their rituals going on around that area. No one knows what they're really up to. Well, what do you think? 
Usually I'm in the know in these sorts of situations. For once, I'm completely in the dark. Oh, I'm clueless, but I know I wouldn't want to find out for myself. Is there anything else you could tell me? Your crew, maybe? Um, they've both called in sick today, actually. Can't say I blame them. I'm still quite shaken up myself. I see. Thank you, Edward. I'm glad you made it out of there all right. I'll see you later now. Thank you, Old Bailey. Evening. Yes. Uh, I spoke to Edward this morning and confirmed what we already knew. Hmm? Oh, he said they called in sick. I asked around. No one's seen them since last night. I don't see that changing. Not sure. He seems to be right in his mind. I think he got out of there quick enough. I'd still keep an eye on him just in case. We don't want a repeat of what happened last time. Alright then. Take care now. Thank you.